I have in my hand a pair of 19th century spectacles. They're really rather small, and one wonders quite how they would fit uh, on a grown-up's face. But they belong to the Reverend John Keeble, who was a poet, a parish priest, a pastor, and one of the fathers of the Oxford movement, the movement of Catholic revival in the Church of England, which powerfully shaped and transformed the Church of England and whose influence was felt in Anglican churches throughout the world. John Keeble was a wonderfully attractive person. Born in 1792, he was brought up in the vicarage at Fairford in Gloucestershire, where his father was the parish priest. His father was an old-style high churchman with a reverence for King Charles I, the martyr king, and a Tory view of the importance of traditional institutions. John was highly intelligent. He went up to Corpus Christi College in Oxford at the age of 16, not unusual in those days, and took a double first. He was elected as a Fellow of Oriel College, one of the most demanding academic tests at the time. John Keeble strongly believed in the personal and pastoral role of the Oxford tutor at a time when very few others saw it in this way. He took reading parties to his Cotswold parishes and these had a formative influence on those like John Henry Newman and Harold Froude who were to play a significant part in the Oxford movement. An old retainer of the Keeble family commented about John Keeble's role in these reading parties that Master was the greatest boy of them all. The England in which John Keeble grew up was one in which there were increasing challenges to the old order. The ripples from the French Revolution and the subsequent revolutionary and Napoleonic wars changed the face of Europe in significant ways. Old maps were redrawn. And although Napoleon's defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 removed a significant threat to England, the Martello Towers found along certain parts of the south coast are evidence of concern about invasion. There was nervousness about revolutionary ideas from France spreading to England. Religiously, England at that time was in many ways still what we would call a confessional state. The Church of England was the church by law established. Dissenters and nonconformists such as Presbyterians, Congregationists and Baptists were free to worship but had to receive the sacrament in the Church of England if they were to qualify for holding office. Roman Catholics were still subject to penal laws even though in Ireland, then of course united with England, they were the majority. The universities of Oxford and Cambridge were Anglican institutions and there were religious tests to be applied to all who wished to matriculate, that is to enter to study at Oxford, and to all before they took their degrees at Cambridge. The Anglican character of the universities meant that they educated and nurtured a large number of the clergy, though there was scarcely anything in the way of what we would call pastoral training. Theological colleges came later and they were in part one of the fruits of the Oxford movement. All church legislation had to be passed by Parliament and because religious tests applied to Parliament it could be seen as the lay synod of the Church of England. The ancient convocations of bishops and clergy existed but they had not met since early in the 18th century. It has been said that in many ways the Church of England at the beginning of the 19th century was still in its structure little changed from the medieval church. The stipends of the clergy varied greatly depending on the endowment of the parish, the amount of glebe land attached to the parish and the value of the living in no way matched either the population of the parish or the demands of ministry. In order to accrue income, it was not uncommon for parishes to be held together in plurality and they could not be those next door to each other but 
quite distant from each other. And the same was also true of the bishops, whose income varied considerably, and so the poorly endowed bishopric of Llandaff in Wales was characteristically held in commendam, as it was said, with the deanery of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Nepotism went hand in hand with patronage, and provided a sharp focus of attack by anti-clericals, such as John Wade, who listed the abuses of the church in the Black Book and the Extraordinary Black Book. There was clearly a need for reform and rationalization of this ancient and creaking system, but there was nervousness amongst churchmen about reform being imposed by government. And there was equal nervousness about the loss of Anglican monopoly, as the Test and Corporation Acts were repealed in the late 1820s, followed by Catholic emancipation. The Reform Bill of 1832, affecting elections to the House of Commons, was passed in opposition to many of the bishops. It provoked some anti-clerical riots, particularly in Bristol, where the bishop's palace was burnt down. Church reform and anti-clerical attacks on the Church always provoke questions about the identity of the Church, and it is this context which was the catalyst for the beginning of the Oxford movement. In particular, it was the proposal of the government to rationalise the Episcopal organisation of the Church of Ireland, the established but minority Church, by the abolition and amalgamation of bishoprics. And it was this which provoked John Keeble, when asked to deliver the customary Assize sermon for the beginning of the Assizes in Oxford in 1833, to choose the theme, National Apostasy. England claimed to be a Christian country, yet the weak government was interfering with bishops and bishoprics. If, as Keeble believed as a high churchman, bishops were the descendants and the representatives of the apostles, then it was sacrilegious for the state to interfere in such a way with the church. So his sermon on national apostasy came to be seen as a rallying cry. When the young John Henry Newman, newly returned to Oxford from the Mediterranean journey, where he'd almost died of typhoid in Sicily, heard of Keeble's sermon, he saw this indeed as a clarion call to recall the Church of England to its apostolic roots. And so the tracts for the times were begun, initially as a series of pungent pamphlets, but soon expanding to longer treatises. Newman asked the question, On what ground do you stand, O Presbyter of the Church of England? Was it on privilege of position, and the emoluments of a good living, or was it on apostolic ministry? Oxford was traditionally a high church university, conservative in character, and was the nursery of many of the clergy. Older high churchmen had already done much to improve standards of pastoral ministry and service. The evangelical movement, of which the Methodism of the Wesleys was part but not the whole, had led to a new zeal in many places. Newman himself had a significant evangelical conversion as a schoolboy, which he never repudiated. John Keeble, some ten years older than Newman, and also Edward Pusey, the third great leader of the movement, gave to the movement an example of pastoral ministry, but also a sacramental spirituality expressed particularly in his book of poetry, The Christian Year which provided poetic meditations arising out of the readings in the church's lectionary for the Christian year. Some are still well known as hymns, New Every Morning is the Love, and Glory to Thee, My God, This Night. The poem for Septuagesima Sunday, a Sunday which in the Book of Common Prayer has its, its theme, Creation, is not often sung nowadays perhaps because of its opening line. There is a book who runs may read, which is not about a marathon, but about the one who is alive, who runs, who is asked to look on the beauty of creation 
and find the created world a sacramental one, symbolic in its particulars of the God who created it. The moon above, the church below, a wondrous race they run, but all their radiance, all their glow, each borrows of its sun. Two worlds are ours, tis only sin forbids us to describe the mystic heaven and earth within, plain as the sea and sky. Thou who hast given me eyes to see and love this sight so fair, give me a heart to find out thee and read thee everywhere. John Henry Newman said of John Keeble that he did for the Church of England what only a poet could do. He made it poetical. And what he meant was that Keeble recalled the Church to the importance of the imagination. It was not for nothing that Keeble's lectures on poetry, delivered when he was Professor of Poetry at Oxford, were dedicated to William Wordsworth. The Oxford movement in one sense was part of the much wider movement of Romanticism which was closely linked with religious revival in many different ways across Europe. And there is a strong literary emphasis in Oxford movement theology and the ideas of the movement were conveyed into the life of the church through poetry and through hymns, hymns ancient and modern which might be said to be the first Church of England hymn book, is a product of the Oxford movement. And the hymns in it contained a number, which we still sing, by John Mason Neal, who translated many of the ancient Greek and Latin hymns of the Church and made that theology available to be sung in the praise of God by members of the Church of England. If poetry and hymns were important, what happened at a later stage of the movement was change in liturgy, a revival of ceremonial, the sense of continuity from medieval services and from the worship of the early church, the sense that worship was a mystery and symbolic in character, and a recovery of the centrality of the Eucharist as the heart of Christian worship. Newman told an evangelical lawyer, Sir James Stephen, who had asked him where he could find a church with good preaching, that Christianity was about more than preaching, important as that was. It was about sacramental worship. So Newman said, Christians receive the gospel literally on their knees, which betokens a different habit of mind from that which sitting and listening engender. Music, art, the mysterious arches of Gothic buildings, a religion which was drama rather than instruction, a faith which was corporate and not individual, and a faith which had social consequences. It is not for nothing that it is the slum priests of the East End of London, or in northern cities like Leeds or Manchester, who are some of the greatest exemplars of Oxford movement ideals. So too was the revival of the religious life. Monks and nuns had not been part of the life of the Church of England since the Reformation and the dissolution of the monasteries, though there had been small informal communities like the one at Little Gidding in Huntingdonshire in the 17th century. But the Oxford movement led to the founding of Anglican religious communities, communities for women such as the Wanted Sisters and for men like the Cowley Fathers. These were examples of community life, a corporate life of prayer and also of mission and outreach. On what ground do you stand, O Presbyter of the Church of England? Newman's question posed this sharply, and what flowed from the Oxford movement as a result was a pattern of life and sacramental worship which transformed and renewed the Church reaching out into many parts of the world where Anglicans took root. It also played an important part in laying some of the foundations for the ecumenical movement, particularly in relationship between Anglicans and the Eastern Orthodox churches and later with Roman Catholics. The church was not an organizational add-on but was an integral part of Christian faith and life. It was a wonderful and sacred mystery, 
not simply a religious department of state. John Keeble saw through the spectacles of the great Christian tradition of the Fathers of the Church, of the Anglican divines of the 17th century, and he was able to express those ideals in his poetry, and also John Henry Newman, so significant a theologian, took those concerns and made them of great significance, not only for the Church of England, but also for the Church of Rome, to which he was converted in 1845.